three, two, and you'll go. Hello, everybody. I'm Commissioner Larry Johnson. I want to welcome you to the reboot of our HOA boot camp that we had. We got some fabulous speakers who are going to energize you, empower you, and help you to be successful in your HOA, your homeowners association. I want to come on board because, as you know, we are in a pandemic. And the HOA plays a vital role in the quality of life of all of our citizens. You are one of the pillars that makes the Cab County a, a good, a great county. Uh, I want you to understand you're more than just covenants. You're more than just a uh, community meeting. You are about helping neighbors connect. We got neighbors who are going through uh, depression. We got neighbors who have children at home doing uh, virtual learning. We have neighbors who really need for us to connect. And the HOA is that asset that all neighborhoods can have or do have that can keep us centered, keep us together, and to help us make a difference in our community. So the resources and information that you're going to receive today, we want you to share it to as many people as you can because it's vital that we stay connected from public safety, from code enforcement, from our census, uh, from what the laws say, what the HOA can do and cannot do, it's very important that you represent in all facets of the role around a homeowners association. And right now, we need more caring, uh, more connectedness, more opportunities for us to get together because our neighbors are, uh, need us. And so HOAs, presidents, vice presidents, treasurers, folks who are trying to form one, uh, make sure that you have a holistic approach uh, as we move forward around our HOAs. And so welcome to our District 3 HOA Boot Camp. Uh, it's a great collaboration that we've done uh, with uh, Mr. Carol Driscoll and Commissioner uh, Marvin Arrington. And I want to uh, kick it off uh, with our presenters today. Uh, we're going to start off uh, with Benita Smith, who's a program manager for our the Cab County 2020 Census. She's a consummate professional. She's been in the, uh, uh, the field around just gathering and organizing communities uh, throughout the state of Georgia, the nation. Uh, she, she knows data. She has made data. Uh, she has humanized data to us and to help us to achieve, uh, which is historic. We now have passed our response rate that we had in 2010. The Cad County now in the, in the pandemic, in the midst of all of these things that are going on, elections, our census uh, count has now matched the 2010 uh, number. And that's an amazing feat from an amazing leader in the team. So Ms. Smith, take it away. Hi, everyone. I'm just here to talk to you about the census and why it's important to the Cab County. Um, I believe my presentation is coming up. Are you able to receive it, Brandon? Yep, I'm gonna put it up right now. Okay. Um, what we really do need is all the HOAs to send out a message to their community members and requesting that they complete the census. Um, that would be a great start with us. We only have until September 30th. So I shall begin. Oh, sorry, you handle it. Okay, so our team includes uh, myself, Marcus, who's our project director, Davina Florence and um, Herman Drew Andrews are uh, work on our outreach team. Uh, we're provided by great support um, staff, LaShawn Atwaters, Dion McKenzie, and Zach Williams, who's the COO of the Cab County and we're under the leadership of Commissioner Larry Johnson. And we formed a complete count committee. This complete count committee is a list of community members that have been helping us throughout the process and using their networks to get more people involved in understanding why assistance matters because we realize having trusted voices in the community um, will encourage more folks to um, actually take the census. Thing. Ding. Next slide. Why it matters that we get 100%. It matters because um, if we were to receive 100% in DeKalb County currently right now, we would receive $1.8 billion a year 
for resources and what happened in 2010, we only had a small majority of, we were less than 73% completed the census, which meant we left $261 million a year on the table for the last 10 years. Um, for example, also, if we would have had a higher percent of residents participated in the census, the Cap County could have received an estimated $4.2 million extra for um, to help us battle COVID-19 through the CARES funding. Next slide. I'm just letting you know of some things we have been doing since we started this in um, since we've been doing more outreach. Our outreach efforts started in August of last year. We've put out um, almost 300,000 uh, push cards in multiple languages throughout the county. We've done 20,000 door hangers. We've done a lot of digital displays, which meant you received a, a banner ad uh, across one of your electronic devices that informed you about the census. We also did robocalls. We did um, 150, almost 152,000 messages, uh, sending out uh, robocalls. Uh, we did over 60,000 text messages. We participated in community food drives. We also uh, distributed information at the COVID sites. So we've been trying to promote it from a county's perspective and for folks to understand why the census matters. Next. So our goals have been to increase our rate and to build an infrastructure where we supported numerous ideas, um, to partner with Trusted Voices, and develop an initiative to, uh, to reach out to our hard to count population. Next. Next. I'll go over what our, our history of self-response rate. The self-response means when you fill out the form yourself and submit the information. In 2000, it was 72% of the Cab County households self-responded. That number dropped drastically in 2010 to 63.6. As of today, we are currently at 63.6 in the middle of a pandemic. So we really appreciate all those who have, all those households who have responded and taken the time out to um, get counted for the cab. Next. And this is what it looked like in August 24th uh, of what the self-response. Avondale is our highest self-response area who have self-responded. Currently, Avondale, 73.1% of Avondale households have self-responded. Um, our two lowest areas are Doraville and Lithonia. And we've been doing a great job of trying to encourage more residents in Doraville and Lithonia to um, get counted. So, you can see that on August 24th, we were at 61.8%. And today, as of September 17th, we're at 63.6. So we're, you know, we're progressing forward. We're not at a standstill. We just got to keep pushing it a little bit more. Next. So we are definitely outpacing the state of Georgia. Currently, the state of Georgia uh, is ranked number 47th of all 51 entities in the country, that's including Puerto Rico. Um, our four cities are outpacing Georgia, also is Avondale Estates, Decatur, Dunwoody, and Tucker. And you can see currently right now, we actually only have two cities that are below 50%. That's Doraville and Lithonia. And so we're asking those cities, even if you live in a city that has a high rate, we still need for you to push more and to make sure you contact your neighbors and make sure your neighbors and help your neighbors with it, with completing the census. Next. So this is what the map looks like now. And the map on the left just gives you an overall and the brownish areas are the areas that where we have less than 50% of that census tract has responded to the census. And then what we did was look at it now on the right hand side where it shows you how it breaks down by commission district. Next. So just um, to give you an overall some outreach activities we've completed to go a little bit more into detail than uh, those 
census by the number of stats that I presented in the beginning. Next. We've had community carnivals. We did door to door. We've uh, distributed materials at local businesses, MARTAs, churches. Um, this was all pre-COVID. Uh, we presented at county commissions, congressional members, town halls, college and university meetings. Next. Uh, we did a lot of design and development for um, our content, so we can we definitely tried to make sure it was it would fit a community. Uh, we produced some PSAs, did some videos. We have a very active and robust social media with Nextdoor, Facebook, Twitter, and on Instagram. Our partners helped us um, translate our messages from audio and video um, to different languages. And we also worked with one of our uh, really good partners, MARTA, before the pandemic and making sure if you were on a MARTA bus, you received information about the census. Next. <laughs> so we held some stakeholder meetings to um, identify what were the um, obstacles to people completing the census. And then we used that, mess we used that as messaging um, when we did radio ads in our promotional spots. Next. We did over 84,000 uh, on-air promotional spots. We did, <coughs> sorry, 5.113 million banner ads, impressions that ran across. Next. Uh, since the pandemic, we've had um, radio ads on Praise 102.5, Magic 107, B103, OG 97.9. So we're definitely trying to reach um, different audiences. Next. Some of our partnerships include the Cab County Schools. So if you have a student in the Cab County Schools, you probably received one of the weekly text messages informing you to um, reply back to the census. We've worked with our library systems our housing authority, the DeKalb area of DFACS, our fleet management uh, place bumper stickers so you can see the census information. And we worked with Comcast and they provided us wireless um, at some of our local events. Next. So this is a breakdown of how our text messaging program worked. Um, we sent out like 83% received a message and not everyone had to reply back, but we did get 13% replied back and let us know that they actually took it. And then those that said no, we were able to, um, we were able to help them fill out the census online. So that was really great. Next. So when we move from the uh, self response rate, we have the total rate, which the total rate includes when the it includes the activities of the Federal Census Bureau and them knocking on the doors. So although we had 72% um, participate self-response rate in 2000, that increased to 78% when you count in the census, uh, the federal census work. And our 63.6 in 2010 moved up to 72% in uh, 2010. So that helped, and that's why I said we have 72%. If we would increase that number, we could receive more money for CARES dollars. Next. Um, some of our outreach strategies until the, in two weeks include, next. Uh, we're doing a lot of events with uh, back to school events. We're doing some events with the city of Doraville. We had a food drive. We partnered with a food drive with Brookhaven. We're in the works of partnering with Pine Lake to do a food drive. We're having this awesome event on September 30th. It's called Census Live and that will be on DC TV channel 23 starting at 630. It will highlight some of the talent we have in DeKalb County and you can also at that time call in 
to one number and we'll help you do the census online. Next. Uh, we provided new flyers to let folks know what we'll, what's a census taker is. And this is for really good information for the HOAs. So you know that if you see someone in your community um, and they say they have a census taker, well, they'll have a bag like shown, they'll have um, a badge number and they won't ask for your social security number or they won't ask for your bank or credit card numbers and they won't come into your homes. Um, okay, next. And we're also doing some more digital displays, but we're focusing on certain geographic areas and our low response zip code. So now we know where our low areas, we're micro-targeting and making sure we we're able to send and blast that message, census message to folks that live in different um, zip codes. And we should be doing about 6 million impressions. So if you go into one of those areas that are where we have certain churches targeted, you'll receive automatically a message on your cell phone or your iPad or an electronic device. Next. And so this is what it looks like. On the left is our targeted churches. You can see it covers throughout DeKalb County. And on the right, it shows what the five mile boundary are. So if you're within that five mile boundary, um, you will receive a message on your cell phone or um, your laptop or your iPad that'll start showing you banner ads about um, our census message. Next. Uh, we're going to do two community caravans. Uh, we're doing one this Saturday that'll go around um, South DeKalb and we'll have three stops. Uh, We'll be at, we'll have volunteers placed at Kroger and two Kroger's and also we're partnering with St. Philip's AME and they're running a robust um, voter registration drive and we will be there to also uh, help folks with the census. And then we're doing another one on September 29th in North DeKalb area, which will go all across Beaufort Highway and end up on Shamley Tucker Road. Next. Uh, we conducted some library census days where we, uh, folks who are returning their books, we, um, we had a little station set up where we would actually take, um, do their census on site. Next. We're doing a drive-in movie. We're partnering with Doraville and doing a drive-in movie on September 25th at 7 p.m. And on that Saturday, September 26th, we're doing a drive-in movie at South DeKalb Mall, and we'll be able to do census uh, registrations on site. Um, I talked to you about the Census Live event. It's going to be great. It is on Wednesday, September 30th. That's the last day you can complete the census. Um, you can call into a number that we'll have posted and blasted all over everywhere over the next week. And when you call in, we can help you live and do your um, census. We'll be doing robocall messaging. Uh, we'll be working with Congresswoman McBath to reach out to residents who live along the Beaufort Highway Corridor. Next. Uh, we still have yard signs. We're connecting with State Rep Carla Drenna and she's uh, putting out a lot of yard signs in her district and with some other state reps. We're doing food drives. We'll be still distributing material as when you come up for your COVID test and they'll be able to provide you material. And we'll be working with, on back to school drive. We have a back to school drive with Commissioner Johnson at South DeKalb Mall on the 26th. And so that's all I have. And I really hope that you let your um, community know that the money from the census is what gets us better roads, better communities, uh, better quality of life. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Ms. Smith. I appreciate that presentation. And what I'm going to do is just introduce our speakers, and then they can go in the order uh, that they are assigned. Our next speaker will be Commissioner Marvin Arrington, Fulton County Commissioner District 5, as well as the founder of the HOA Alliance. And I just want to thank him uh, from the bottom of my heart because he has bought Cobb County, uh, Rockdale, Henry County, Clayton County, 
he has brought all of our counties together to focus on uh, the rights and responsibilities of HOAs. I, this wasn't even on the radar screen for me and he brought it to me, Commissioner. Uh, we have an opportunity to just build stronger communities and where we are. And he puts together, and it would have been in November, the largest HOA gathering, uh, I think, in the country. Uh, we bring all these counties together with HOAs and we have it at the, uh, the Georgia World International Conference Center that's uh, in uh, College Park, Fulton County. Of course, you know, COVID is stopping us from doing it. But also his wingman, who I like so much because he's a connector and a resource gatherer as well as Mr. Driscoll, the founder and president of the HOA Alliance. And I thank him as well for uh, bringing us timely presentations and, and subject matter, matter experts who really can help HOAs to be empowered to succeed and just make a difference in the lives of uh, the residents who live in that community. Also, we're joined by our director, of code enforcement, Mr. Tim Hardy. I call Mr. Hardy, he, he's the man who, who's just one phone call away. Uh, I can call him whenever. And he continues to make sure that DeKalb County blight is eliminated. He has his code enforcement officers out in a timely manner to make sure that we're dealing with uh, issues that can help bring our property values down and issues that will cause nuisance in our community. I just thank him for his, his service, especially in COVID-19, uh, this type of service of code enforcement uh, and what they're doing to really assist us in this leadership has been uh, very helpful and good. And also no stranger to many of you all is Major Danny Jordan. He's our major of our police department. He was in South DeKalb, he wanna leave me and he, he gonna move on up. And now he's over in the East DeKalb area. But uh, this is a guy, who we were having a peaceful march and it was his birthday. I'll never forget this, his birthday. You know, he came in to help us to make sure that the marchers and everybody was peaceful uh, and came out. He was directing traffic and making things happen. I said, Major, you supposed to be on your birthday. He said, no, Commissioner, I gotta make sure that this is right. That's the type of servant leader and heart that we have at working for us in our police department. And so I thank him for his service. I thank him for what he's doing. And so you're gonna hear from some, uh, some great uh, speakers and subject matter experts who really, really care about the cab, our state and our nation. And so I'm gonna turn, turn it over to our commissioner, uh, Marvin Arrington and Mr. Driscoll, then Tim Hardy and Major uh, uh, Danny Jordan. So you all take it away and thank you all for helping to make the cab county strong and making a difference. So thank you so much. Okay, Commissioner, we're actually going to go ahead and move into Director Hardy um, with this storm. Unfortunately, Mr. Driscoll's power went out, so he'll join us back as soon as he can. So, Mr. Hardy, take it away. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Tim Hardy. I am the Deputy Director for Code Enforcement for DeKalb County. Our job is to enforce all of the county ordinances as they relate uh, to private property. And of course, most uh, HOA uh, members are private property owners. So I wanna talk a little bit about how um, code enforcement differs a little bit from the enforcement uh, of covenant restrictions. And then I'll get into uh, what we're doing in DeKalb uh, during this pandemic and how we're actually working. Talk a little bit more about uh, most commonly found violations and then I'll get into some of the uh, some of the zoning issues that um, most HOAs have to deal with uh, uh, periodically. So if we we'll put up the slide, I will get started. So, just real quick, the. County ordinances uh, are ordinances that are passed by the commissioners uh, and then uh, codified and, and placed in, in a document called the Code of Ordinances. Uh, they're enforced by our DeKalb County Code Enforcement staff. Um, most of the violations have fines that are punishable up to $1,000 or sometimes maybe even uh, six months in jail. Now that rarely happens, but those are the possible penal measures for most code violations. Uh, once our officers uh, issue the prerequisite warnings or sometimes immediate citations, those cases are then taken to our uh, court system and our solicitor 
prosecutes those cases and then the court finally makes uh, a disposition of those cases determining what those fines may be if they are uh, we also place stop work orders on, on locations. If you're in your neighborhood and you see that there's building or development going on and there aren't any permits visible, please give us a call and we'll be out uh, rather quickly to determine if a permit's required and then place a stop work order uh, on that location. Uh, any day that the work continues beyond that stop work order, uh, they're subject to citations for, for each day. And again, those cases will be taken to magistrate court. Now, in contrast, uh, covenant restrictions are rules that are imposed by the developer or uh, the, I guess, the most common name is the declarant, and they're also enforced by the HOA. Uh, there may be some fines uh, or fine schedules that the HOA has in place, but that's strictly enforced by those people that are put in place by that HOA organization. Uh, sometimes uh, they're, they will take their... Um, the declarant will take the other members of the community uh, to small claims court and maybe to get a judge to make a determination if in fact that, that homeowner is liable for those penal measures that the HOA is trying to enforce. Uh, if, if there are warnings, uh, that should be written uh, in, your, uh, in your declarations or your HOA rules and regulations. Uh, so I would look there first if there's any question as to whether or not the violation that's enforced by the HOA is proper and correct. And if not, then you can always reach out to my department and find out if in fact this is a violation of the uh, Code of Ordinance for DeKalb County. Next slide, please. So what we're doing in DeKalb during this pandemic is we've been asked to reduce our staffing level daily so we can avoid um, um, getting sick or exposing our employees uh, uh, unreasonably. So we've reduced our staff from about 32 people in the field per day to about eight folks in the field per day. Now this skeleton crew, uh, of course, could not handle the volume that we would typically get on a monthly basis. We currently uh, receive around 800 uh, complaints per month. So what we've decided that might be the best course of action is to deal with those cases that we call critical services or critical violations or, or the um, health or, or safety related type violations. And some of those are listed here below, uh, unsafe buildings and structures uh, that are in danger or, or complete, complete collapse. That would be high on our uh, priority list. Unsafe equipment that may present any danger to the public. Uh, rooming houses, boarding houses, uh, any of the assisted living type facilities where the, uh, the conditions and danger the occupants there, that would be a priority inspection as well. Sewer leaks or any kind of contamination or unsanitary conditions on private property is something that we take very seriously and we'll get out uh, rather quickly on those type of inspections. Water intrusions that may make any house or property uh, uninhabitable, uh, that would be a, a critical type or priority type inspection. Of course, if you live in a community uh, and you care about the community, one of the things you want to really look out for is, is building without permits. So if you, you see some uh, activity going on again and there are no permits posted, that could directly affect your property value. So I'd encourage you to give us a call, let us come out and take a look at it and see if in fact that permit is required. Uh, vacant structures, uh, a lot of times within your community or maybe just outside of your community, uh, there are structures that are open and vacant uh, and have several type of um, exterior violations. There may be some uh, overgrowth of weeds and grass, trash, things of that nature. Those will be high on our priority list as, as well. One of the things we want to do or we're trying to do during this uh, uh, public pandemic is, uh, is keep our staff and well the rest of the public as safe as possible. So that's our critical staffing plan for now. Uh, if that changes, there will probably be some, uh, a memo or some uh, correspondence to go out, but that's where we stand now. If anyone have any questions about that, I'll be happy to address them later. Next slide. Our, our code enforcement division is located on Candler Road, right at the corner of Clint, Candler and Glenwood. The physical address is 1807 Candler Road. Uh, typical office hours would be 8.30 to 5. Of course, no one's allowed uh, to access the office at this time. 
but uh, we're only a phone call away. You can reach us at the number below, 404-687-3700. You can also submit uh, complaints via email or via fax. Uh, we do have a, um, a guard that, uh, that's at the building every day. So if you wanted to hand deliver a, a complaint, you could actually uh, pass those off through the door and he'll be happy to take them. And then our admin staff will get them into the queue and we'll go out and, and uh, make those inspections accordingly, uh, you know, time permitting. Uh, again, we try to keep everybody safe. So we're following the guidelines of, of the Centers for Disease Control. Next slide, please. Some of the most frequently or most common found violations are, are, are things like tall weeds and grass. Now, some HOAs may have some very strict uh, um, grass cutting, mowing, or manicuring uh, type uh, regulations that they enforce. But in DeKalb County, the rules is the grass cannot be higher than 12 inches. And that 12 inch um, uh, maximum will apply with the, for anything within 150 feet of the building or structure or the house, so to speak. Anything beyond that does not have to meet that 12 inch um, um, parameter, but it could be enforced as uh, unsanitary conditions should the overgrowth become excessive. Um, one, of the, one of the other things we get a lot of calls about uh, are apartment complexes. And I know that this does not directly relate to HOAs, but since we may have some, um, some apartment dwellers uh, in the audience, mm -hmm. uh, if you have a complaint about your apartment, one of the first things we ask you to do is to actually report it to the management group. Uh, one of the questions we'll ask when we get on site is have you reported this problem? Has the management responded? Or is there some type of written work order for this? So if you have some uh, relatives or neighbors or folks you know that reside in the apartment areas, please let them know that the first thing they should do is report those problems to their management staff and then contact code enforcement. It just makes it, uh, 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 streamlines the, uh, the enforcement action a little better. Next slide. Now, if you, if you grew up in a community similar to me, uh, there's always somebody in the neighborhood that uh, repairs cars or wants to work on cars, or maybe they just have a hobby and, and they wanna work on their own cars uh, in their driveway. This would be problematic if you have, uh, again, some strict HOA regulations. Uh, in, in DeKalb County, it specifically says that no person shall overhaul any vehicle or permit anybody else to overhaul any vehicle or work on a vehicle uh, other than the three exceptions we have here. That person performing the, the, the work has to live on the premises. Uh, the, pers the vehicle that they're performing the work on has to belong to that person. And the work has to be done completely inside a garage unless, unless there's work that can be completed within three days on, the, on that premises. But no person shall permit the overhaul of uh, any vehicle, um, I'm sorry, on the premise of any commercial or um, industrial property. So if, if you leave your community and there's some local stores or gas stations or, or um, you know, God forbid, uh, a, a family dollar, and there's some auto repair working on, uh, going on in those parking lots, please give us a call and we'll address it right away. It has to be an authorized automobile repair establishment for that work to happen. Next slide. We get a lot of questions about how many vehicles can a person have in their driveway or how many people vehicles can a person have on their property. Well, DeKalb County does not have a limited number of vehicles, but we do limit the type of vehicles you can have. When I say the type of vehicles, that means the condition that they're in. You can't have any vehicle parked or stored on your property that is unregistered, has expired registration, or does not have a lawful license plate for that particular vehicle that the plate is on. If you have vehicles parked, like visibly parked on your property that are missing any of those items, you're in violation of the inoperative uh, vehicle regulation and it will be addressed accordingly. Now, the HOA, of course, again, may have some more strict regulations. They may not allow, may not allow those cars, uh, any cars to be parked outside on the street or outside the garage. 
But as it stands, DeKalb County does not allow unregistered vehicles to be parked on site. We don't allow vehicles to be parked on non-all-weather surfaces or non-hard surfaces. That's the grass. So if you have some additional vehicles or additional family members that are visiting, it's important that they not park on the grass. We get a lot of uh, um, calls about that type of those type of violations. Where can I apply for a building permit? Uh, that's going to be done at 330 West Ponce de Leon Avenue. That's the Planning and Sustainability Department. They're the permitting uh, agency for DeKalb County. That's where you submit your application. They'll do the plan review for uh, for the work and then subsequently issue the permit that you're seeking. Uh, their phone number is here for your review, 404-371-4915. Next slide. Can I remain anonymous when I report a code violation? And the answer is yes. Now that can be affected somehow based on the type of violation that you're reporting. Well, one of the examples we have here, if you're reporting uh, a lighting problem on your neighbor's property, say they've installed a, a floodlight that shines uh, over onto your property and you can't sleep at night because of the light. Well, in order for us to make that inspection, you can't be anonymous because we'll have to come to your location where the violation uh, is happening and determine if in fact um, the, the number of foot candles or that light shining beyond their property line. Uh, we also um, comply with uh, the Open Records Act. Sometimes there's some information uh, within complaints that uh, has to be um, communicated to the, uh, to the requester based on the Open Records re request. A lot of folks want to know how they can get a copy of their case. Again, if you contact our office at 404-687-3700, we can make a determination if, in fact, that information is available right away. And if so, we will uh, make co copies of those um, pertinent documents and uh, email them or mail them out to you. Uh, we would normally have a, a, a method where you could come to the office and get them, but of course, things are a little bit different now. Uh, how can I get a copy of the ordinance? Um, the code of ordinances are online, uh, www.municode.com. If you click on Municodes and click on the state of Georgia, there'll be a drop down for the Cab County. And there'll be a whole uh, book of um, ordinance and regulations that you, that you can choose from. Uh, if you have some questions about specific ordinances, of course, please don't hesitate to call our office. Education is one of the uh, things that uh, we pride ourselves on. Next slide. Building permit certificate of occupancy. Uh, a building permit or a certificate of occupancy shall be obtained again from the planning and sustainability department. Before any new building or new structure can be occupied, the permit has to be issued, the inspections have to be completed, and the Department of Planning and Sustainability have to issue what we call a certificate of occupancy uh, to uh, say that that building or structure can be occupied per the code. Uh, accessory building and structures. This is a, a, a very hot button item, particularly for HOAs. Uh, if you live in an HOA community like mine, they don't allow accessory structures. Uh, some HOAs will allow accessory structures, but just keep in mind what the Cab County regulation says, you can only have one permitted accessory structure on each property. And there are certain um, uh, uh, building or, or architectural, architectural designs that have to accompany those accessory structures, such as pool houses, sheds, or things of that nature. Basketball goals are... Um, that are attached to the principal structure in the cab or abutting the driveway of a residential shall be allowed, but you can't have any portion of that play area uh, in the public right of way. Uh, some of your HOAs may require that you have them in the side yard or the backyard, or again, they may not uh, allow them at all. So again, check your dec declarations uh, if you have any questions about basketball goal or structure and where they can be located. Next slide. Definition of family. 
I think this is very important, uh, given that we've had an influx of what we uh, what we call uh, Airbnbs and some of the pad splits that are in our communities these days. The uh, Cap County defines family as three unrelated individuals. Now, the the Fair Housing Act also requires us to allow up to three mentally handicapped or disabled persons to live in one single family structure, as long as they are living as one housekeeping unit. Now living as one housekeeping unit means that they have access to every part of that house. So you can't have someone living on the main portion of the house and have restricted access to the basement and then have a couple other people living down there. Then you'd be in violation of the single family uh, dwelling regulations. But as long as those three people have access to the entire house and are living as one housekeeping unit, they can do that. Uh, if the family members consist of more than three people, but they're all related, either by blood or by law, then there's no violation there. A lot of times we get calls because uh, families, uh, particularly during this uh, COVID, families have six or seven different people living in the house together. But if they're related by blood or, 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 or uh, by law, then those families can exist there together. But if you see anything else that's out of the ordinary as, as far as uh, residents are concerned, or if you see um, a builder or, or a, um, a property owner who's decided to uh, split the house, make different rooms, have some characteristics that are not consistent with single family dwelling living, please give us a call and we'll come out and, and check it out and determine if in fact a violation exists. Next slide. This is just a list of important numbers to call. Uh, please uh, um, pass this out or, or um, pass it along to anyone you think that may have a, um, uh, a reason to, to call any any of the DeKalb County agencies. It's a, a, a very handy tool to have. Um, and with that, uh, I'll take any questions. No questions. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hall. I believe, uh, Major Jordan, would you like to go next? Yes. Are you able to hear me, Brandon? Yes, I can. OK, awesome. You yeah, have a slight have, echo. I hear an echo for me. You hear an echo? Yeah. Yeah. Mute so it might be on the phone and the computer. OK, I think you should be fine now. OK, thanks. Okay. Hold on. Can't hear you now. Need to unmute the phone. Yeah. It's not unmuting. Uh -oh. Brandon, I'm ready if you want me to go ahead and jump in. <laughs> um, I just uh, need to be promoted to uh, presenter. I think I did prom promote you. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, Director Hardy, I can't, or not Director, I'm sorry, Major Jordan, I can't hear you. You can't hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. I still got the echo. Okay, I think you just need to mute. Hold on, let me try. All right, can you, can you still talk? No. No, that's not it. He needs to unmute the phone. Yes. I'm trying to unmute it, but it's not unmuting on my end. What about now? You'll have to turn uh, down your computer volume. 
since you're using your phone? I'm not using, I'm not on my phone. Still connected. But we can go ahead with Mr. Driscoll and then we can come back to you, Major. Can you guys hear me at all? That's great. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Is that better? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're ready. Brendan, whenever you're ready to start, I'll go ahead and start. All righty. Hold on. I'm going to pull it up. While he's bringing it up, I'll just say that uh, my name is Major Jordan. I'm with the Cap County Police, and we have four precincts here at the Cap County, and I'll basically be representing all the precincts. We call that the Uniform Division. Um, so what I'm talking about will pertain to all of our majors within a um, Uniform Division: our North Central Precinct, South Precinct, East Precinct, and um, our Tucker Precinct. And as the Commissioner stated earlier, I was originally at South Precinct when we put together this slide, but again, this applies to everyone. So um, we wanted to talk about HOAs. So one of the main things we wanted to talk about here is um, the Cab County Police Department, we work very closely with all of our HOAs um, and establishing neighborhood watches and community um, organizations to ensure the communities remain safe. And although we don't actually assist with establishing HOAs, we do um, share the responsibility of you know, deterring crime. And that's pretty much what everybody's looking for from the police department. But our biggest thing, we do, we do that through the neighborhood watch program. And we, we offer that to all neighborhoods, not just neighborhood watches. So you can go to the next slide, Brent. So we'll talk about the neighborhood watch program, which pertains to um, any neighborhood within the Cap County that wants to, you know, figure out a way to deter crime or lower crime and work closely with the police department. And, how, and we'll give us some, some examples of how effective that can be if you partner with the police department. Next slide. So one of the reasons is, uh, why would you start a neighborhood watch? Next slide. It's, it's cost effective. Uh, creates bonds between the neighbors. As I, sta as I stated, you get to know your neighbors. It reduce reduces burglaries and robberies. And it partners with the police department, as I stated earlier. Great benefits there. Um, so what does a neighborhood watch um, do? So each residence acts as a, a set of eyes and a set of ears. Um, the residents you meet in a neighborhood and you learn how to make your home secure. And you report suspicious activity to the police department, obviously. And we work very closely with you. So getting started, there's a simple checklist. Um, you obviously have to have a group or people that are committed to establishing a neighborhood watch. Um, there's a planning committee to initiate the program. Um, you want to establish a very critical, you want to establish a list of issues um, that you need to initially address. Every neighborhood may have some different issues, but you want to try to find out initially what is that the main problem that you have in your neighborhood, because we want to focus on that problem first. And once you get that neighborhood watch um, plan and that program established, then you can tackle other issues within the community. Um, so there needs to be a, a means to communicate and obviously, just like we're doing here today, you can have social media or you can do email or flyers. And you want to um, have some publicity for the initial meeting. You want to make sure you put that out. And as with any meeting, you want to have a meeting agenda to keep you on track and a good location to meet. But even what we've identified as COVID through COVID, um, social media, Zoom, and those type of things are a great place to still be able to meet with each other online, virtually. Next. So this slide just pretty much addresses um, how to know your neighbors. Um, everyone pretty much kind of works these days and come straight home and go to start dealing with the family. But it's very important to get to know those neighbors. And the commissioner can attest to this and, and Tim Hardy can definitely attest to this that all too often we get caught when a problem is starting to get out of hand. But if we get to know these neighbors, you can have that, you can um, know which neighbors um, live to the right of you, across the street from you, in the back of you. And you want to have these meetings before you start having a problem. So that's why another reason why the neighborhood watch is extremely effective. And the one other thing that was on my mind before I forget, HOAs are extremely good. They're great. It, it, it gets people to bond together and come up with one mission to attack something. But it also sometimes, we, uh, our biggest thing is we don't want you to be uh, um, silos where you're out there and you're just starting 
to have your own HOA and you're not really addressing other issues in other communities because what affects one community, although it may not be affecting your community right now, if you don't communicate with other communities and, and your neighbors, then it can probably bleed over to your community and we start having additional issues. Next slide. So, um, so we got some, some, some tips here, just some simple tips that we talk about every day, all day, all throughout the year. And we talk about locking it, remove it, light it, close it, hide it, and report it if there's a crime. And that lock it and remove it is very critical. We're still seeing even today, where people are leaving um, guns in cars, laptops in cars, jewelry in cars, money in cars. Um, if you leave it there, somebody is, is, is going to attempt to take it. We may not be able to stop somebody from breaking into the car, but we definitely don't want to have guns out there or even something that you may feel is very valuable just, just to you and your family. So remove those items from the car. And if, if you do be having, be having to become a victim, make sure you report it to the police department. So at least we can start identifying areas where we, we're seeing an increase of entering autos or whatever the case may be. If you don't report it, we don't know about it. Um, next. This right here is a crime tracker. Um, we often ask uh, what type of crime goes on in my neighborhood. Uh, every uh, citizen within a cap can go to um, crimetrack.com, go to www.decap county police department and you can get your crime track and you can log on and you can actually put the addresses in within the communities, um, your zip codes and so forth. And it'll tell you what type of crime is in your specific area. Um, so this very um, handy tool to have. Next slide. And that's gonna be the questions and answers uh, session. But before I get to that, this is the list of um, the key personnel. You've got uh, Chief uh, Ramos, who's our police chief. And right up under her is um, Chief uh, Pedro, who's our Uniform Division Chief, and I explained to you the Uniform Division consists of the four precincts that we have in Cab County, and we've got the precinct um, phone numbers there. Um, this is the older, this is the older version, so you just have to uh, flip myself and Major Banks out. Um, we've we've actually updated ours, but same phone numbers, but we, we both just flip flop precincts. So he's now at South Precinct, and I'm now at East Precinct, and of course Tucker Precinct is Major Metland, North Central Pre North Central is Major Rutland, and that's pretty much it as far as it consists of HOAs. Um, but the way we really partner with any HOAs is we want to get those neighborhood watches established. And if um, you have any questions, you can reach me here at South Precinct. You have my phone number. You have the phone number to all the other majors at the other precinct. And we all work extremely close together. So even if you call the wrong precinct, we'll get you to the right area. That's all I have unless there are any questions. Questions, I'm good. That's it. All right. Thank you, Major Jordan. We appreciate that. Um, now we will move, move on to Corel. If you want to take over? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'm presenting my slide. So just going to go ahead and play uh, my PowerPoint slide on my uh, phone. I've had to resolve to my phone because of the power outage. Um, first, I want to make sure I welcome everyone to DeKalb County's virtual HOA boot camp. Uh, just a couple of uh, house cleaning things I want to do. Number one, because of the number of questions we receive uh, at DeKalb County directly to the HOA Alliance and all of our Metro partners, we've uh, started a help desk. And if you look at the very bottom, you'll see where we have the short URL, which is tiny.cc HOA Alliance Help Desk. Please take note of that uh, and, you know, visit the help desk, join the help desk, pretty easy. Just fill out a form that includes your name and your email address. We also are, as a second phase, setting up where you can just email the help desk and it will create a ticket for you to help with tracking our responses uh, and tracking your response or feedback. We've also produced an HOA handbook, um, not to try to pump it for sales, but um, this HOA handbook will help uh, anyone that's interested in board services and those that want to be aware of how an HOA uh, community association operates. Um, I'll be doing a video 
uh, on navigating the HOA handbook. It's full of templates um, and other types of documents that you can take a look at that will help you out. So my presentation is essentially about the transition of a community from the declarant control to a uh, homeowner elected control board of directors, right? So you're moving from that phase where the declarant has the power to appoint board members to where the homeowners have the power to elect board members, right? Essentially, when we talk about a, a transition, it's really a process that exists for training uh, up and coming uh, board members uh, and transitioning control of uh, managing and operating uh, the uh, community. You know, and, and what does that entail? When there's a transition, you're transitioning the control of your common properties, which could be your clubhouse, your pool, uh, your interests, all of the common areas that are owned by the community association. When we think about transition, uh, I'm sorry, Brandon, you had you, you were saying something? This is LaShawn. No. We can't your slides haven't come through yet. Really? Oh. I thought I had it down to a slide. Okay. Let me just check my Zoom real quick and we'll get that going. But as I check, um I'll just go back and you know, when we talk about uh, the transition, the transition is really all about ensuring that the new board of directors, which are the homeowner elected board of directors, are elected and trained to manage your community. Can you all see what I have now? LaShawn? No. no, it's still frozen on our end. Okay. Um, one sec here. Uh, I took it off. And let's. Uh, yeah, it's always a, a happy day when you have to do stuff on the mobile phone. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to attend. Okay. So let me. Thought I had selected. I'm going to stop sharing and share it again. Okay, let's go document. All right, so, and I'll just keep having these discussions. Um, I can speak about the transition because I have hands-on experience with uh, with actually going through a transition with our management company. First, I want to say that if there are some uh, hard feelings, I'll, I'll keep it light, between the management company and any of the people that are on the, uh, what's the term I'm looking for, that's on the new board, then the management company may not cooperate. Although it specifies in the contract between the community uh, and uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Uh, with the community and the management company, they will renege on the contract. So it's really important that you maintain somewhat of a, a, a level, a relationship with the management company. Uh, generally in communities, and this is consistent across all counties that we've seen in Georgia, there is some hard feelings from uh, the residents of a community and distrust of the management company, especially when it comes to financials. And I have to share this slide with them at, at some point. Um, and what that means is that they may not cooperate with the transition of the important records. Uh, we actually had to result to uh, so, uh, including the management company in discovery with some litigation to get them to turn over all of the community association's records. Uh, and when I say all, I say that lightly because it wasn't all of the records. So when you think about the transition of your, your, your documentation and important documents, 
We're talking about Article of Incorporations, the Declaration of Protective Covenants, restrictions, in any and uh, all in any other. Um, um, what's the term I'm looking for? Different types of rules and regulations that have been implemented by the board. We're looking at minutes. We're asking for financial statements, at least from the inception of the community association. But by law, they're only required to maintain those records for seven years. So if you're a community that got delayed when the economy, uh, I'll just say, fell out, then you could end up being under the thumb of the community, uh, the declarant board for a significant amount of years. And so by law, other types of documents, they only have to, uh, they only have to maintain three years of those documents. Um, and so all of these records that I've mentioned are important, but you may find uh, many residents or people who are interested in the board are really looking for the financial statement, the budget, uh, any type of uh, documentation that uh, provides some insight on where did the money go uh, as far as your dues. So in my community, our budget was about uh, close to 200000 um a year uh, when it was under the declarant board. The declarant board spent a significant amount of money on landscape, pool services. Those were the two highest budgets in our community. And you know, in your community, you may not have all of those types of uh, amenities. Um, if you have a clubhouse like we did, we were renting them out to residents, uh, but that uh, income is not protected from paying taxes. Now, your dues, you're not, you're not uh, required to pay taxes on it. And so although the declarant board was maintaining and operating your community, and let's say that new board takes over, you can't say, oh, we have a new HOA. That's not how it works. Your community association is registered with the Secretary of State as a not-for-profit organization. So any decisions that they've made, any litigations that has occurred, you have to pick up where they left off and manage and operate your community. Uh, so I generally would recommend that Anybody that um, has aspirations for uh, joining a board for your community or they have taken over your community, they need to have a time period to be able to re review those records. And as a board member, you have unfeathered access to those records. You don't need permission. If you want to see it, they need to make it available uh, to your community, and you should not be charged as a board member. That doesn't – that doesn't um, – those type of rights don't um, uh, uh, fall through for other residents that live in your community. Homeowners, et cetera, they have to put in a proper request for books and review. Uh, it gets approved. They have to follow uh, your declarant uh, rules in providing access to those records. Usually it's within five days. They have to schedule. Uh, you have to go in review the records, you may have to take a camera or a copier. I took a copier, a small copier in and scanned uh, all of the documents to a PDF onto a thumb drive. That allowed me to get through those records quickly because you only have a time frame. So just be mindful that this transition for board, for board members that have been elected by uh, other homeowners in the community, you have uh, the right to review those documents without restriction. But you may not get that type of cooperation from uh, 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 the management company. But you need to just pull out that contract, hold them to the contract, uh, and see if they will cooperate. Um, and you may have to even think about some litigation to get access to those records. And, and I say that lightly because, in, like in my community, you have to put a vote, have a vote, uh, with the, the homeowners of your community who are current in our community to vote to litigate or not. Now, if you're suing for dues uh, not being paid, that's different. You don't require the permission of the homeowners that live in your community. And so that, those, those are some of the challenges that most uh, management companies don't talk about. But when they're selling to your community, they talk about training, 
continuing education. We just found that that's not happening. And so as uh, uh, new board members, you have to be diligent about continuing education. Uh, CAI has uh, a great uh, number of events where they're providing education, but you'll find that most of it's for the vendor members, like the management company, pool company, et cetera. And you may find one thing that's targeting uh, resident board of directors. So um, you have to be diligent. I've attended a number of CAI training events. Uh, how, no matter how small it was, I appreciated the training because it opened my eyes to um, my uh, responsibilities and some of the th tasks that has to be accomplished by board members. I also recommend that each and every one of you uh, join the, uh, I want to say USAA so bad, United, uh, God, I'm sorry, it's evading me right now, but they have free board training, not specifically for HOAs, but for all different type of nonprofits. Uh, it's a welcome training. It's an eye opener to your responsibility, uh, your fiduciary duty uh, to the community. And, you know, just to add a little flavor, I participated in about five lawsuits uh, in my community over things that uh, we consider that was petty. So, say, for example, one of the requirements as a board is that you must maintain meeting minutes. The secretary of your community is responsible for maintaining those minutes. They need to be openly available, be transparent about those meeting minutes. Um, uh, you need to operate your meetings using the Robert Rules of Order. Um, you will find that the officer roles are uh, identified and elected by the new board members. They elect their president. They elect their vice president. They elect their treasurer, their secretary, um, and it's their right to uh, appoint those officers, elect and appoint those officers, not the residents. It's not based on uh, the number of individuals uh, that, you know, receive the most votes. That right is reserved by the board. Why is that important? Because with the transition, I'll use the president as an example. I operated in that role for about five years. Um, and the president sets the agenda. The treasurer is responsible for accounting of all of the monies. So when you're approaching, uh, generally it's the management company, to transition over to the elected board members, then once you obtain all of the records, you have your head wrapped around the financials, you then are responsible for budgeting moving forward. And that's a part of the duty that most residents, you know, get to hold you accountable. So you need to understand what has taken place with the finances up to the point where you've taken over because now you are ac accountable. So just to use as an example, we found that our management company, because they were managing so many communities, they were paying bills of these other communities using the dollars from our community association. And believe me, when you have individuals who want to take control of the board, I'll use that term loosely, they will use or paint stories about the financials and hold their board accountable for those, for those records, uh, for the spending of the money. And so that's why it's really important that a transition takes place as early as, as possible. So if you participate on the advisory committee, you can start asking these questions so that you can be ahead of what's taking place. Now, remember, we talked about management and operation. I've just given some, some uh, examples. I dive probably too deep into that. Uh, but again, we'll make sure you get a PDF copy of this presentation. As the new board members, when you take over management and operation, you're responsible for uh, collection. Any type of fines and fees that should be collected, that is on you. That 
in my opinion, is one of the hardest things to do when you work uh, as a board member. So, again, going back to education, doing your due diligence to make sure you understand what is taking place, uh, you need to understand both state laws and federal laws. Uh, so like uh, the, uh, uh, the Collection Act, you need to make sure your head is wrapped around that uh, so that you can make decisions based on the information that you have. So I always recommend that a community association make sure they hire an attorney. That attorney will help you with wrapping your head around the various state laws and federal laws that a community association has to abide by. Uh, one of the things that we researched was uh, reporting to the credit bureaus uh, on individuals' uh, credit report. We decided against it because we didn't think it was a, um, uh, um, uh, a, a good way to engage uh, the residents of our community. But the new board that came after us, guess what? The first thing they implemented based on our research. Now they're reporting on people's credit report. And so if you're having a hard time paying your dues, paying your mortgage, and you want to try to move, well, they just hindered you from moving uh, and obtaining uh, maybe another home, an apartment. Uh, those are the things that, in my opinion, hurt people. And so if, if as a resident, you're contacted by the HOA in reference to owing some money, entertain them, stay in contact with them. Uh, and I understand most board members are very difficult to uh, c catch up with. The management company acts as a, um, uh, uh, I'll say, the defensive line. Now, again, after the transition, you as a homeowner must look to the association similar to when the declarant was in charge of the association to resolve any type of issues uh, for guidance and assistance. Remember, your HOA is a business registered with the, uh, at Secretary of State. So if the last board identified that, they're, they're, that you had some equipment like a playground uh, that needed maintenance, then they need to uh, take it seriously, or you need to take it seriously, and uh, uh, have a study and identify what's required to maintain any of the common areas, uh, especially places where kids play. Um, I shared within our HOA Alliance Communities United group uh, where an HOA lost $20 million in a judgment for a kid where the playground didn't have the maintenance. They ride it out hit him on the head, caused brain damage. Essentially what happened for the members of the community, they were just now, just after that award, then assigned $80,000 each to cover the lawsuit, right? And I'm going to get into insurance, but in, in, when you're dealing with insurance, that's the number one priority for board members is to make sure that the community association is properly insured because you have to make sure you hold your board members accountable. You, as a homeowner, uh, are, are the checks and balances. Because the community didn't have sufficient insurance, that's how they ended up with 80,000 each. So that's a special assessment on top of your dues to cover the $20 million. And all the board had to do was make sure you had ample insurance. I've seen some communities take, and I use this term loosely, a cheap approach to protecting the, the members of the community uh, and uh, the uh, uh, common areas. They only had $2 million in insurance, which left $18 million to be covered by the residents, and you have to divide it up by all the members of the community. I, that's that's one of my worst nightmares as a homeowner in a community association to be indebted to something like litigation when the board didn't take the time to A, do a reserve study, B, 
do a maintenance study and ensure that they protect the homeowners in their community. That's a significant amount of damage. All right, I won't repeat what I've talked about under the governance area, but overall, to transition, it's a gradual process of training and providing insight on financials, um, the financial state of the community, uh, and making sure you have ample insurance. All right, I think I've talked at length about the records. Folks, I've never seen such, I'll say litigation in reference to providing records that are owned by the community association. Now, typically you'll find a, a community association have these transitions take place between uh, uh, management company to management company. I don't know your situation, but uh, I believe that the transition should take place with the board of directors wholly involved. You need to learn, take time to learn about the different types of records that you have in your association, the process of collections, um, managing community spirit. All of those things are really important when we talk about transition. Time check, Brandon. Uh, you're, you're good, but yeah, you're good? I think we've got okay. a couple more minutes, one, one or two minutes. Okay. Okay. So I want to continue to expound on governance. When we take, think about governance, that's, that's where operation and management falls. One of the things I re recommend to all new board of directors, uh, if your budget permits, hopefully it does, order a review of your financial records. Uh, I'm not talking about a full audit. You have them to remove, re review your financial records. They can identify if there are some improprieties by taking a look at a review and whatever section you have more questions about, then you will get an audit. But I do recommend uh, having your books reviewed at least every two years and to share that report with the residents of your community. That falls in line with the transparency. Number two, have a reserve study done initially when you take over. With the reserve study, they will provide insight on when the roof should be changed on your clubhouse or your, your security area, when the parking lot needs to be resurfaced. Uh, if, you, if you're in a private community, they will provide insight on roads, uh, maintenance and repair. Uh, you know, just, just make sure you get at least those things done from an insurance perspective. Make sure you have a significant amount of insurance to cover your community and your residents. What I mean by residents, they're stakeholder. Again, just going back to that $20 million lawsuit and 80000 uh, per household indebted because of the award. I, as a, uh, a resident in a community, a homeowner, I wouldn't take that too lightly. Right? I may even fall, uh, partner with some other residents to sue the board members for negligence included with suing the association. And that's generally what happened. Every lawsuit that we had to deal with in the community was a lawsuit of the association and us as individual board members. Now, we indemnified based on the article of incorporation, but that doesn't protect you from being sued. That only protects you from covering the loss. So you want to make sure you have directors and uh, officers insurance as well as general liability insurance. Um, that I consider to be the most important aspect of working on a board, making sure you and your family are protected. Because I've seen some cases where the spouse of a board member got sued. So you have to make sure they're covered. Uh, it's, it's, it's an area that you want to make sure you're protected because based on the business rule, as long as you do your due diligence before making a decision, you may take some advice from the attorney, you may do your own research, it's up to you if you want to resolve to using your own advice as opposed to the attorney 
or the plumber or the electrician. Just make sure you do your due diligence because now you have a fiduciary duty to the association. You don't specifically have, in my opinion, fiduciary duty to individual members of the community, but the collective, you do. All right, so I'll sign off here and I'll get you uh, my presentation, uh, Brandon, and I'll also convert it to a PDF so you can share it uh, with the uh, attendees. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you all so much. You've heard from our ex experts. Uh, we want you all to join us as our, we continue our HOA boot camp. We won't be in a COVID-19 situation next year. I want everybody to be a part and, and, be, and, and learn from this one. I want you to build on this. And we want to hear your testimonies and what you have done as, as you have heard this information implemented uh, from these great speakers. So be careful, be safe. Let's continue to make a difference. And I want to thank our, our presenters again today. I really appreciate your time and your efforts. And thank the District 3 staff, Mr. Fields and Ms. Atwater, for pulling us together to make a difference. Everybody be safe and thank you and, and have a great day. Thanks.